Another very haunting case is the story of missing Tara Calico and the strange association with a young boy. Well, in 1998, Tara Calico was a very busy young woman. She worked at a bank in town, was studying for a degree in psychology, and fitted around this, she regularly worked out or participated in sports. She often went out for a bike rides. And on the day she disappeared, she set out as usual on her morning ride. And before she left, she asked her mum to look out for her when it got to midday. And that if she wasn't back by midday, then she wanted her mum to come and pick her up. The reason she said this was that she was concerned because in the past she'd got punctures on her bike and this had delayed her and then she would be late for work. Well, that day when midday came and went and her daughter didn't return home, her mum duly set out in her car to go and find her and bring her home along with the bicycle which she presumed had a puncture. But when she drove along the route her daughter always took, she didn't see her daughter. She checked all the way there, and then she returned back home, expecting to somehow have missed her daughter, and her daughter would now be at home, but she wasn't there, and now her mum was concerned, so she immediately called the police. A patrol car quickly arrived and started searching for the girl and the police found a cassette tape along the road that looked like it had probably come out of a Walkman stereo. But they didn't find any other signs of her or her bicycle, just some bicycle tracks. Where she was cycling was a straight route that cut through in a straight line with very few intersections, no buildings and no trees. So there wasn't really anywhere for her to be if she wasn't on the road. As the police extended their search area to a distance of nearly 20 miles, they came across a walkman lying in the road that her mother identified as being hers. Her mother believed that her daughter had dropped it as a way to leave them clues and a trail to follow. Well, this was close to a remote campground called the John F. Kennedy. And the trail ended there at the base of Mazano Mountain. Witnesses had last seen her at close to midday and less than two miles from her home. They'd also seen a pickup truck close behind her. The police, however, were never really able to identify that truck. Well, despite all the searches, no other signs of Tara were found, and a year passed with no further leads or any information or clues about the girl's disappearance. Despite the police searching everywhere for her, no other signs could be found, and they were at a complete loss to explain what had happened to her. Then a year later, and hundreds of miles away, in a parking lot outside of a grocery store in Florida, a lady parked her car and walked into the store. When she returned with her groceries, the white truck that had been parked next to hers was now gone, but what she found in the parking space on the floor was something horrifying. As she bent to pick it up, she saw that it was a Polaroid picture and it depicted a harrowing scene. The black and white photograph showed two children lying on a bed, bound and gagged. There was a boy who looked to be in early adolescence, and an older girl. They were both staring anxiously into the camera, obviously incredibly frightened, and the image horrified the woman. She drove to the nearest police station, telling them that it must have been dropped by the man she'd seen in the driver's seat of the van that was now gone from the parking lot. She described him as a man with dark hair and a moustache. 
The police responded immediately, setting up roadblocks to try to find this man in the van, but it was too late, and he'd already presumably left the area. When the mother of Missing Tara was shown the picture, she was convinced that this was her daughter. The parents and family of a missing boy were convinced that the boy in the picture was their son too. He'd also gone missing in New Mexico that same year. He'd been at a campsite in the Chibola National Park in the Zuni Mountains, which was less than 50 miles from where Tara lived. The little boy had gone to the National Park campground with his dad and a friend of his father to hunt turkeys. They'd only been at the campsite for a short while, and they were still setting up, when they realised that Michael, the little boy, had disappeared. His father and the friend immediately started looking for him, thinking that he must have gone off wandering, but they couldn't see him anywhere nearby and quickly they found a ranger and reported him missing. The search was started, but a sudden storm came and made it extremely difficult to look for him in the wilderness. Snow was falling fast, despite it having been quite warm earlier in the day, and the child had only been wearing thin clothing. Nearly 500 people searched for the little boy, including the rangers, the National Guard, the police and many volunteers, spanning out over a 10-mile radius. Even air searches were carried out. Tracks that were thought to be his were seen in the snow, but no one could be absolutely sure that they were his. Despite bloodhounds being used, there were just too many other scents from all of the volunteers and search and rescue teams, making it impossible for the dogs to distinguish the boy's scent. Well, despite a week-long search, the little boy was not found. What most people involved in the search believed had happened was that he must have wandered off, become quickly disoriented and lost, having only just arrived in the area and being completely unfamiliar with it, and then become unable to find his way back to the campground. Many of those involved in the search believed that what had happened to him was that he had then succumbed to the cold and died of exposure, and eventually his body would have suffered natural predation. They also felt that when hypothermia began to set in and became severe, that he would possibly have burrowed and crawled into an enclosed area, which was what victims often did, according to these searchers' many years of experience. But still, no remains were found. And then came the Polaroid photograph, which both families of the missing little boy and of Tara said contained the bound and tied images of their children. The boy's father said at the time that even the boy's best friend said it was definitely the boy. Although the father said he wasn't 100% sure, he also didn't know if that was because he didn't want to accept that it was his child pictured in such a vulnerable way. Then there was a new twist in 1990. The missing boy's remains were discovered approximately eight miles from the campground in the mountains. A horse rider had come across some human bones in a thick copse of trees that were identified as Michael. No one could explain how he had ended up dead eight miles away from where his father had last seen him. But it now seemed unlikely that the boy had been taken to Florida, tied up and photographed on a bed, and then returned to the mountain and left there. But if the little boy in the photograph was not Michael, then who was the other boy in the photograph? Well, between then and now, two other photographs were reported as possibly containing Tara. They were never released to the press or the public, but it's known that one photo is an out-of-focus image of a girl with duct tape over her mouth, mysteriously found by somebody at a construction site. 
the photograph was examined and it was discovered that the type of film was only manufactured after 1989. The second photograph was of a woman on a train, blindfolded. Well, neither of these two newer photos were identified as definitely being the missing woman, but they weren't ruled out either. Her mum felt that it could be her, believing the images bore a very striking resemblance. The local sheriff, Rivera, said that after 20 years, he himself was convinced that some local boys whose names that he knows had run her off the road and buried her. He said that they'd probably killed her by accident, then panicked and covered it up. He said that what he lacked, however, was a solid piece of evidence with which to prosecute them. Then adding another twist, however, to the mystery again, was another photograph that materialised. It was sent to the police and the local newspapers in 2009, in which there is a young boy who has had a black pen drawn over his mouth, making it look as though his mouth has been gagged, just like in the original Polaroid photo from 20 years ago. Then there is a second photograph with that, and this is of the original boy from 1989. These two photos were sent to the police and media around the time of the anniversary when Tara Calico went missing. So was this some kind of clue? What was the sender hoping to achieve by sending them these photos? Was it some kind of sick hoax? But if so, how did the sender of them have, in his possession, the original picture of the boy? Was the abductor and possible murderer taunting the authorities, showing them he'd got away with it? There was nothing the authorities could do with the photos. There was nothing that would lead to helping them solve the case. Well, the letters containing the copies of the pictures were posted in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The authorities were not sure if the boy in the new photograph was the same as the boy in the original photograph with Tara. So really, both cases have still never been solved. Nor who is behind them. What I find quite interesting as well, is that when recently a man was arrested for the disappearance or well, the abduction of Ashley Freeman and Laura Bible, which was a basically a double murder, arson and an abduction, but baffled crime solvers for a couple of decades. Well, it seems that one of the girlfriends of this man who was arrested came across some Polaroid photos that had been taken of these two girls tied up before they were killed. And although presumably this has got nothing at all to do with the Tara Calico case, obviously, but I find it interesting that in this case and in the Calico case and also in the West Memphis 3 case where the boys in West Memphis were killed and the three went to prison, Damien Eccles, etc., and their conviction was overturned, so it was a really famous case. Well... There was supposed to be gossip and rumour and reports of a briefcase that was passed around and it contained pictures of the three victims of the West Memphis Three. Although in their case, it was photographs that had been taken by a mysterious stranger who had photographed them while they were playing outside of their homes in West Memphis. So it makes you wonder if there wasn't some kind of underground swapping service where people would swap photos of these young victims. Something to think about. It could simply just be that this was the way that they did it to record things like taking trophies and souvenirs of victims 
and this was prior to the internet, prior to video cameras and things, so maybe they just took photos as mementos. But it does make you wonder if there's some kind of an underground network going on.